Everybody, thank you so much for uh, being here. Uh, hopefully, this is uh, information that you can take with you even today. Like, for example, I'm going to go dancing at 1 o'clock uh, today, so I'm not sure if you have any events planned today or tomorrow or anytime in the future, but hopefully, it's information that you can take. Um, and obviously, um, you know, there's so many, so much to talk about. Um, I, I wish I could tell you in one hour everything that I know, everything that I've seen, and answer all of your questions. I'm going to try to over the span of the next, who knows, indefinitely. Um, but thanks for being here, <clears throat> and we'll get uh, rolling. Uh, so my name's Adrian Randa. I'm a physical therapist. been practicing about 13 years. Um, I took about a year and a half off to do some non-clinical work. So I worked in the health tech uh, company last year, and now helping with business uh, development in uh, a neighborhood in Manhattan that's historically underserved. Um, I've been swing dancing for about eight years. And, um, you know, I, I think I've, I've, uh, I've always been active. So I, I had years of doing martial arts. I did CrossFit for a long, long time. Um, at one point, I was, um, you know, doing CrossFit, jogging, doing swing dancing, uh, all in parallel, all at the same time. Um, I'm currently in the Big Apple Lindy Hoppers. It's been one year. Um, I started doing aerials about, um, I would say, about two years ago, maybe like right, right during, during and after the pandemic. And it's been great because um, just been learning. Uh, I I used to teach physical therapists and graduate and, and, and specialists. And over the years, I pretty much think the most important thing is about understanding your own body. And and I think that's probably the best the best educator is knowing your own body. And then if someone like an expert comes in, whether it's a chiropractor, whether it's whether it's me, a physical therapist, whether it's a doctor. Um, being able to communicate your body's needs and your body's history is such an important thing. And that's part of like the first topic of conversation I wanted, I wanted to discuss, which is like the mind-body connection. And there's a couple different layers to that, which has to do with understanding your own body, being able to protect yourself and say no. Um, one of the coolest things that I learned when I was doing aerials was we have a saying, um, you know, if you think you have three more in the bank, mm, probably just do one more. Um, and it's listening to your body. It's also communicating, telling your partner or potential partner that, hey, you know, I, my shoulder is not doing so well or my wrist is bothering me or my back has been bothering me. So it's totally fine to be communicative as much as possible. It's also necessary to communicate with your own body, understanding, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, um, I have a weak core muscle. I know I have weak mo muscles in my shoulder. I know I have hypermobility or I have a lot of mobility in my ankle and my shoulders and my hips. So being able to understand that in your own body is gonna be super important. And the reason I say that is because if you know that you have a limitation going into something, uh, into the, for example, a, a big event, right? So in New York City, uh, ILHC is coming in May. And so I recall last year what it was like and how intense it was. It wasn't just the dancing, it was also like the excitement and the adrenaline that comes with it. And so I knew that I had to warm up that, that day and I had to do certain things to prepare my body for what was about to happen for the next three, four nights. That was, I think I only did the socials for, for three, for three uh, evenings. But being in tune with your body is one of the most important things. And part of, part of that is moving. It's just testing your body out and trying different things and listening to it, knowing your own history. And then there's the mental component. And so even if you are on the dance floor, and uh, you, know, you probably hear this a lot uh, about like, you know, have better posture, I wish I had better posture. But sometimes there are things that I, I, I tell people it's you practice and you exercise to train your body to do that automatically just like in any form of movement and then there are times where you have to remind yourself to do that action and a lot of times what i've, I've noticed and i and i hear and to be frank with you the reason i started doing this was because i think over the past two weeks i had like four people ask me pt questions and questions about an injury in their forearm an injury in their shoulder and so I said, you know, I feel like there's a need in this community to, 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 to use my expertise and help people. And so, for example, back to the mind-body connection is that if you're a follower, and I was guilty of this when I first started, started swing dancing as a lead, um, sometimes you can have a lead who's a beginner or not, or just a strong lead that can pull your shoulder really uncomfortable. Or when you turn, your shoulder gets pulled. 
knowing that you're going to have these um, random events happen that you have you have some control over but not too much knowing that if you have a weak shoulder to mentally tense up and in one of the videos that, that will be released on, on, my, on my YouTube channel um, today kind of talks about just before you get on the dance floor you know just squeezing your shoulder blades and waking them up and it's not about improving your posture it's about waking those muscles up because I don't know even as even as um, even as a, a, a clinician, I can ask you as many questions as possible, but if I don't know that you sit at a desk all day hunched over like this because that's how you focus, and I've seen this a lot in journalists or even in engineers where you're so hyper-focused on your monitor that when you go to swing dance and you have to do this, and I'm talking about predominantly right now followers, and I have to do this to do a turn, your body's not used to that. and so. By doing even this for 10 seconds or 30 seconds, your brain says, oh, I need to use those muscles appropriately. If uh, another example is uh, your hip muscles, your glute muscles, right? Let's just say you're not a sedentary office worker. You actually stand a lot during the day. Your muscles, your butt muscles are pretty much going to be active in this direction. But when you go into a basic step in swing dance or if you have to squat down, your glute muscle has to bend and it has to contract. So if you're just straight up this way most of the day in your job or whatever it is that you're doing or even just, you know, maybe you're walking a lot that day, if your glute muscles don't contract, then they're not going to work. And that's where injuries can occur. So even just a little bit of a contraction in your glute muscles, your quad muscles, your calf muscles, get your brain to turn those muscles on. And so that's kind of something that um, gets neglected that something is so so simple that anybody can do at any moment nobody has to see you stretching in the corner nobody has to see you doing you know leg raises or calf raises you can just literally stand and just tense muscles up and right before sometimes maybe I'm doing a performance and maybe I'm rushing or or maybe I'm just excited about an event I will just contract my muscles depending on how I'm feeling that day or depending on what I did earlier that day so that's something just to keep in mind that's so simple that you, nobody has to know about it. It's not, you know, um, you know, extravagant, uh, but it does a little bit of something. So just keep that in mind. All right. Um, and so as I continue to move forward um, in the comments, just because I'm trying to understand the community and I want to give us the best tailored content. So if you put in the comments, as I'm speaking at any moment, um, tell me what kind of, if you're a lead follow or Leaf and follow and switch. Um, if you predominantly do Lindy Hop, Charleston, Balboa, Collegiate Shag, uh, Blues, uh, put it in the comments. If you do all of them, that's totally fine. If you do two or three, um, if you perhaps are just even thinking about swing dancing, if you're, you know, just kind of, I want to know what, um, you know, what you predominantly do. Um, tell me about kind of things that you're concerned about in, in swing dance for the in relation to your body and also tell me where you're where you're zooming or google meeting from as well um, and th that helps me kind of tailor these webinars in the future or any other content that I create uh, to to us to the swing dance community all right so the next topic is to me about knee injuries now you know <clears throat> the knee is interesting because uh, as someone who's been practicing for 13 years and even knowing some of the researchers in sports medicine and, and knee rehabilitation and surgery and just it just injuries and chronic pain um, the knee is interesting because the knee and I say this time and time again in a lot of my videos and to patients but the knee is actually meant to bend and straighten it's not really meant to twist and so obviously in swing nets as you may know we do a lot of twisting and so the knee kind of gets caught in the middle of your ankle joint and your hip joint and so it if if it does this predominantly and all of a sudden you don't have any support from the knee or the ankle of the, the hip or the ankle then your knee has to do extra twisting and the cartilage in your knee doesn't necessarily like that the cartilage in your knee actually likes compression not too much compression not too much decompression either. it's like a nice little balance think of a sponge that you're using to wash dishes but occasionally what happens is there's too much twisting because there's a number of factors that I can tell you in my experience. I had a patient, for example, um, teaching a dance. Uh, this was back in 2009. Teaching a, uh, no, got a contract, a big contract with a big fitness online uh, DVD uh, company. 
to do salsa, uh, salsa, cardio salsa or something like that. Was on crutches, and this is a personal trainer, super fit, super knowledgeable, and was limping on crutches, no surgery, just, just chronic pain. Long story short, it was her obliques, it was her core muscles that were not helping her support <clears throat> her knee. And so her knee was doing so much rotation that ultimately the muscles around it, the cartilage, was starting to wear and tear. Now, everybody wants to jump at the cartilage and the meniscus, <clears throat> and don't get me wrong, you can get an MRI, you can get uh, uh, different imaging, and you can have meniscus problems, but most often what happens is that the muscles around the knee are actually the culprit that are compressing the knee joint, causing that, that pain. So the meniscus is between the two joints, but if you have a quad muscle, you have a hamstring muscle, that they're telling your body, hey, you know what? The hip and the ankle aren't helping us, so we're gonna, we're gonna really lock down the knee and pr protect it. It's moving like this, so the quad pulls this way, the hamstring pulls down below it, and compresses the knee joint. And it either could just be the muscles causing the problem, it could be also your adductor, which is on the inner thigh. So think of your groin going all the way from your in, inner groin hip all the way down to your knee. That's a knee muscle. And also, you've probably heard it called the IT band on the outside of your thigh, which is not necessarily a muscle. It's a, it's a thick band, but there's a muscle at the very top where your hip is. So if those muscles try to compensate, and that's like a buzzword I try to tell everybody. I think it's probably the best one to explain what happens to our bodies. It's compensation. And that's why I wanted to start with the mind-body connection because if you ignore something for long enough, your body's gonna do its own, it's gonna do whatever it needs to do to let you triple step. Even if it's at the expense of protecting your meniscus cartilage and using your quad muscle, or using your adductor muscle, or using your hamstring muscle, it's going to do as, as much work as it can to protect you. And so although you're feeling pain in the knee, there's many times where I, I see a patient, I see a swing dancer, and I press on their quad, maybe like above the knee, maybe like, let's just say hand length up above their kneecap, and they feel the pain, they're like, oh my gosh, it goes into my knee. I thought that was my cartilage. I'm like, eh, it's not. Or I press on their inner thigh or their hamstring, or maybe even on their tendon where your kneecap is, there's a tendon that goes right into like the top of your shin. Sometimes I push on that and the person jumps up and like, oh, and I'm like, yeah, it's not your cartilage. I can't touch your cartilage from so far outside. There's ways I can kind of get to the cartilage, but ultimately, your body is going to compensate. And if you don't address the weak parts, and there's not always just weakness, there's stiffness as well. So thinking about that on the dance floor, we're doing a lot of rotation and twisting and turn, changing direction, your knee needs to be super protected. And oftentimes um, when I see um, you know, my, my uh, friends in the swing dance community and, and they're going to get treatment and, and I'm not, you know, putting on any profession. It could be physical, my own physical therapy colleagues, chiropractors, massage therapists, orthopedic surgeons, sports medicine doctors, you name personal trainers, and they're not addressing the whole body, then the knee is gonna continue to suffer. And sometimes it's just putting a bandaid on top of it, right? So with knee injuries, always check to see if your hip is stiff and your hip needs to turn out, but it also needs to turn in. Okay, your ankle needs to be able to push off the ground pretty controlled and with balance. It needs to be able um, to control you uh, on your tiptoes and, and a good test that you can do. And I think I have a, uh, I will if not, if not already in one of my videos, is like uh, don't hold on to anything, go up on your tiptoes and hold it and see how much you sway back and forth. And that's a good indication of something is not working correctly. So I would gravitate towards it being that your ankles are weak, but it can also be your core, it can be your hips. So ultimately with knee injuries, it's overcompensating. Your knee is getting compressed or twisted too much. So the muscles around it and the tissues around it are trying to lock up. And that's 80 to 80% 80 of the time is actually what gives you the knee pain. Over years, now, then the cartilage starts to become irritated and that becomes a problem where you start to consider surgery or injections or pills or things like that. So all in all, Make sure that your hips are strong, hips are mobile, ankles are strong, ankles are mobile as well and flexible. And then if that doesn't work, we usually go up to the core muscles, okay? All right, so the next uh, subject is shoulders. And so feel free in the, in the comments to, you know, let me know if there's any particular moment during uh, dancing that um, your shoulders uh, can get irritated. And obviously, we're talking about dance. And so even in the statistics and all forms of dance, shoulders are kind of... Um, they're lower in epidemiology, in other words, like how often 
uh, people complain about shoulder problems in NIDS, it's pretty low, but it, 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 I think it's just, it's just less reported. And so part of it is that, um, you know, we're on our feet, we're jumping around, we're on our toes, we're balancing, we, we have the balance, right? And the pulse, that we're always focused on the lower body, but a lot of times, and frequently, recently, I'm starting to notice that there's a lot of shoulder um, problems and wrist problems and forearm problems, and sometimes even elbow problems. And so I'm trying to make sure that I don't overlook that because it's not as common, but it's really prevalent. And if you think about it, if you're doing a swing out and you have anything here being problematic, that's something that's going to be uncomfortable. And then even if you're performing, even if you're just trying to, you know, improve on the dance floor, you just took a class and a workshop and you really just want to improve your swing out um, and, and anything from your fingertips is bothering you, um, that can, that, that becomes really, uh, interferes with your ability to dance and be comfortable. So the shoulder, similar to the knee, but <laughs> similar but different, okay? Um, the shoulder has a lot of mobility. It's got so many directions to move. And so in a way, you don't need to protect it as much as you need to work it and to make all the muscles powerful. So, you know, with the shoulder, you want to directly impact the shoulder blade and the back muscles and then that joint becomes a little bit more protected. Now, the shoulder itself, this is, happens very commonly where I see a patient and they come in with a shoulder problem. And I notice that they have weakness in their, and sometimes it's up in the neck, it's in the back over here. Uh, sometimes it is the core muscles and believe it or not, sometimes it's actually your hip muscles that can contribute to this shoulder being painful, unstable, and or stiff. Oftentimes they already had an elbow or a wrist problem before that. And so usually when people have a shoulder problem, they've already had something happening in this area or vice versa. If you don't clear this up, you start to feel this down here. So with the shoulder, oftentimes it's, you have to understand that if you hold your frame up, your shoulders are working quite a bit. They're being pulled and tugged and pushed and pushed in different directions. So you need to be able to start a motion and be able to stop the motion. And so by doing strength training in the shoulder area, which both means a lot of pulling exercises. So if you have a gym membership, using the weights and the machines and the cable pulleys or dumbbells is a good way to get those muscles activated. Um, make sure mentally you're working on those muscles in the back, you're thinking about them. Those are the muscles that are getting tired because if I give somebody an exercise where I say you can do a row, call this rows or a shoulder retraction, or you're pulling back, pulling exercise, Oftentimes, they don't always feel it in the back of the shoulder where you should feel it. They'll death grip that handle, and then this problem becomes worse, but they start to, you know, pretty much compensate once again. Working on shoulder deltoid muscles on the top, so doing exercise where you lift up, um, pulling exercises, if you're doing any type of basing, you're leading, you're doing aerials, um, you're doing some strong swing outs, really fast Lindy. Um, or Charleston, you know, things over your head where you're pushing weight over your head is be pretty important. Um, and does that be very heavy? And I don't want anybody to think that, you know, this is a, a muscle building, it's a strength, it, 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 sorry. It's not a muscle building thing. It's really, you're trying to train your brain to use those muscles. So as much as you might think that, you know, going to the gym, you're gonna put on muscle, maybe you'll get slower on the dance floor or for whatever other secondary benefits that are not so uh, pleasing, it's ultimately to tell your brain these muscles need to work. Even, even when you're not dancing, these need to be able to turn on and turn off whenever you need to. And what strength training does and using bands or dumbbells or going to the gym or not going to the gym, I'm a big fan of doing stuff at home, um, it reminds your brain to use those muscles so that when you're on the dance floor and somebody asks you for that first dance, your body's not being pulled and has to wake up instantly. You do the training outside of the, off the dance floor. So on the dance floor, your brain knows exactly what to do, when to do it, and it's safe. And so ultimately exercises for your upper back muscles, exercises that are gonna help your shoulder and your neck muscles, which is pushing up, and rotator cuff muscles. So using a band, um, something easy, you take a band and you just open up and so it's something like the motion is this, okay? And that's gonna help the rotator cuff muscles. Those are the small muscles that fine tune the movements. So let's just say, uh, this happens all the time, you know? You do a swing out, you just mess up. Maybe you're exhausted, maybe you're just thinking too much or 
you know, maybe you have a beginner or you yourself, just for whatever reason, you messed up a little bit or you, you thought the music was going to change at a certain point, those rotary components fine tune your shoulder so it puts it right in the right place. And that's why it's important to exercise to prepare your body to do swing dancing. Uh, and so that's for the shoulder. Um, and let me know if there's any, anything else to clear up, but ultimately it's get your back muscles to be very strong. It's get your shoulder muscles on top to be very strong. Get your rotator, rotator cuff muscles to uh, be strong. And doing those exercises, you're going to see a difference on the dance floor. You know, I had somebody, uh, one of my team members had uh, forearm problems. I see he had forearm problems. And I noticed when I would do, uh, um, for example, uh, any kind of turn, uh, this arm would just, it would be, and this, you know, follow was very, very strong. A very strong dancer, very strong. For some reason, when I would push off, this hand would just move a little bit too much. And after like maybe three months, uh, this person came up to me and said, hey, you know, can you help me with my wrist? And I said, all right, sure. And I realized the wrist was super strong, you know, grip was super strong. The pain was actually somewhere over here in the muscle. And I said, you know, let me, let me check your shoulder. And as soon as I had uh, this follow put the shoulder and I pressed on. So what I do is I usually strength test and I push down the shoulder, shoulder came down pretty easily. I did the other side, solid. Couldn't budge this follower. Uh, test of the rotator cuff where I, where I push, no strength, the other side, pretty solid. And I said, you know what? Stop doing any wrist exercises, stop doing any gripping exercises. Foam roll your forearm, strengthen your shoulder. And uh, we were practicing shoot throughs uh, in this occasion. And that was when a lot of the pain was. So guess what? The shoot through, putting your whole body weight, these muscles aren't helping, guess what? You're gripping for dear life because these muscles aren't supporting you. And so that was a case that happened this past month actually. And then now, even when I do a turn, I know that there's a lot more strength and the shoot throughs aren't, aren't bothering the smaller as much. So it's all connected. I'm gonna say these things over and over. It's overcompensation, your body compensates, it's all connected and so I would always say, hey, listen, if your shoulder bothers you, work on the shoulder, get it stronger. Um, and then if that doesn't work, look somewhere else because it's all connected. It's probably, and sometimes it can be that someone has weak uh, grip muscle strength or weak wrist muscles and it could affect the shoulder if the shoulder's working extra hard. There's also, I keep talking about strength, but there's also flexibility in the shoulder. The shoulder does have to have a certain amount of flexibility to be able to do what we do on the dance floor. Okay, and so there's just easy stretches, you know, you can do this, right? You can even reach up your back. A lot of times we forget about this motion, but guess what? If you're doing, um, you know, a swing out with the Texas, right? You have to put the follower's hand behind the back. If they don't have that, they compensate somehow. And it's not always evident. As a dancer, you're so good at cheating that you can have this much range of motion in your shoulder and your body will do something interesting to get through it, but aesthetically, it'll look good. And I actually have had times where very, very, very high level dancers, movers, athletes can't do a range of motion, but if I stop them from cheating, I can, I can detect where the problem is. But if I let them do it on their own, they have incredible ability to show and to lie to, to even an expert um, about the true range of motion. And so there's some places that I do is, is just, you know, here's a stretch. Right? Just reaching over your head as a stretch and have your foot so it's blocking me. Uh, reaching up your back, just holding like this, walking around the, your apartment, walking around the street. I can even sit back on my chair and it kind of pins it for me. So keeping, a, so the shoulders I mentioned earlier, is the shoulder has a lot of mobility, different than the knee, has a lot of mobility. So it needs a lot of protection and strength, but it also needs to have that ability to move in all directions. Right? And so if you have too much flexibility, your muscles are going to compensate and try to pull back. If you don't have enough flexibility, the muscle have to pull extra hard to get you into that range of motion. Um, and so the shoulder is an interesting one where it needs a lot of strength to support it and it needs enough flexibility to be able to not be held back from any direction. Okay, so the next moving on is the ankle. Very similar to the shoulder and the knee. So if you put the knee and the shoulder together, there's a lot of mobility and there isn't. So in the foot itself, not too much mobility. In the ankle itself, it has significant amount of mobility depending on who you are. Now, ankle sprains a lot of the time come from the hip, and this is research proven, it comes from the hip weakness, or itself in the ankle, just a lot of ankle weakness. 
And so if right now, for example, you might get loose tendons in the ankle that can't support you. So when, you, when you're walking, you twist your ankle. When you're uh, doing uh, any move in swing dance, your ankle twists, or depending on the shoes, your ankle tends to twist a little bit easier than others. The tendons themselves either get weak or they get overstretched. So if anybody right now is sitting at your uh, computer, if you're on Zoom, maybe you're on your phone and, and walking around, that's totally fine. But if any of you are at your computer and you're sitting, take it, don't even move, but think about what your ankles are doing right now. Okay, so I'm on a high chair right now. My ankle, one ankle is sitting on kind of the rung and the other one is actually tucked behind the rung, flexed like this. My right one is this and my left one is here, flexed on top of it. And so some people will step on their ankle. Some people will cross their ankles and leave them like this for hours and hours and hours while they sit. Uh, other people will cross their leg on top of the other. And guess what? That stretches up the hip. And so it will affect the ankle down below. So that's where I talk about the mind-body connection and being aware of what you're doing throughout the day um, before you head out to the dance floor. And, it's, and, if, if, and depending on how intense and how many hours you spend, how much practice you do, or performing, or just social dancing, or learning, or classes you're taking, that's where it's important to think about your day. You know, from 9 a.m. when the day starts, maybe it starts at 6 a.m., 5, 5 a.m., maybe you have kids, maybe you have a partner, maybe you have an animal, a dog, a cat. Um, assess what your body's doing. So if your ankles tend to be tucked under, if you like to curl your toes and tuck them under on the floor, those are things that are gonna stretch out your tendons. And they're gonna be a little bit looser, just like a rubber band, if I held a rubber band up for a long period of time, it's not gonna be able to snap back. And you need to have both. So your ankle muscles, you have ankle muscles on the outside of your ankle, the inside of your ankle, the top, the bottom, and the back of your shin. And so all of those muscles, I call it kind of like a cue, right? So all of the muscles have to have enough power and strength to control you. Because as soon as you go up on your tiptoes to do, you know, let's just talk about, you know, a Charleston or a Lindy Hop basic, six or eight count. As soon as you go up on your toes, you have a lot more room to twist your ankle. There's a lot less stability there. So for the ankles, assess how much you're stretching your ankle throughout the day or on the other hand, you could also have very stiff ankles and you need to actually stretch them a little bit more. So sitting like that with your ankles tucked under might be a good thing to do. Stretching against the wall is a good thing to do. So keeping in mind, it, am I loose or am I really stiff? See which one, which one of those you are and lean into that. On the other hand, and there's times where I see people, um, <laughs> I see, I see, uh, I've seen it a couple times this past couple uh, months, is that people have very good flexibility and they always they keep stretching and they feel tight but when you look at their ankle their whole their ankles like touching their shin or you know they're like triple jointed <coughs> excuse me they're triple jointed and I'm, like, I'm I'm looking at them like why are they why do they want to keep stretching and really what it does is that when you have that loose rubber band right what do you do to make a loose rubber band tauter you pull it tighter and it gets looser and then you pull it tighter and then you kind of wrap it around something that's your body asking for more compression but you're doing yourself a disservice. Oftentimes when people strengthen that area, they feel looser and they don't feel it, but usually they feel like a knot somewhere in their, let's just say your calf muscle, they feel a knot and they just wanna get rid of that and it feels better to stretch in the short term, but it keeps coming back. I 90% of the time will strengthen that person, tell them to stop stretching unless they definitely need it. And oftentimes they actually feel better. It's a longer term process, maybe like within four weeks, they'll feel a difference. But that's kind of a illusion that you feel that your body wants to be more flexible and it really doesn't. It's just trying to keep as snug as possible with what you have. So I usually say the simplest thing to do is just work on your calf raises, but the problem with calf raises is that depending on if you watch yourself, you know, record yourself, have something you watch you, if you go up on your own, you might feel a little bit off and so your body's gonna compensate and cheat and use other muscles. If you go up on your toes, you also will go up only as far up as your uh, strength will allow you to. So you're still missing a significant range of motion or flexibility or mobility. So using like a table or a chair to push off and give yourself some help to make sure you get the full range of motion of that muscle working is going to be important. So that's for the ankle. Now, in the same thing, if your ankle is very stiff, your ankle is always going to be pointed down and it's always going to be at risk of being twisted. So having good flexion or flexibility pointing your foot towards you is also important. A calf stretch against the wall over time will do it. Now, if you stretch like crazy and you're always stiff and it just doesn't seem to get better, 
Mm. I usually will say, let me check your hip. I'll go up the chain or go up and see, uh, we call it chain, means like your whole body is a link of chains. So like your ankles, one link in the chain, your shins, another link in the chain, your knees, a link in the chain. And so when I say chain, that, that's what I'm referring to. Um, and so if the ankle is being stretched and there's very little progress over two or three weeks, or you're being diligent, I would usually say your hip is probably weak or stiff. And once you fix the hip, the ankle gets to relax and do its thing. And then it'll loosen up because your body's saying, uh-uh, I don't want to loosen you up because if you loosen up, you got a loose joint up there and you loose down here, that's room for trouble. So that's something to think about uh, with ankles. Then also uh, your toe muscles. Oftentimes, the research is showing that sprinters, the better sprinters, I think it was like 100 meter, 400 meter sprinters, the sprinters that had stronger toe muscles tended to be faster and do better performance wise. So, because, you know, as dancers, we're on the dance floor, your toes are kind of the last line of defense. You know, you move, you slip a little bit, the toes will, will help you out. So, with ankle sprains, with ankle injuries, it's, it's, it's look at the ankle itself, make sure that it's strong as possible, watch your posture. By posture, I don't mean this posture all the time. I mean the posture of, you know, your body when you're on a Zoom, if you do this all the time, if your head's halted all the time, and it's not necessarily intentional. It's just the ways our, our bodies focus. But if you're able to snap out of that, you can rebalance your body, right? And there are times where your body doesn't need to be in balance. Right? So if you're dominant on, uh, in the, on the dance floor for one direction, it's totally fine. There are ways that I'll talk in another webinar. Uh, it's a little, little bit of a, it's not, not even advanced, it's just a little bit of a specific, special topic to discuss about how to be symmetrically asymmetrical. Right? So if I know that, for example, this arm when I'm doing the, uh, um, over the shoulder, this arm is what does most of my work. There's ways to train so that this side gets healthy, even though it needs to do a lot more. So there's a way I can reduce the overuse injury, even though this arm is doing 90% of the work. Um, but back to what I, what I was referring to was, you know, with the ankle, look for if you're too mobile, if you're too stiff, see if you're uh, too weak in the ankle, you check your toe muscles as well, um, and then check the hip muscles, check the hip joint to see if that's flexible enough. And if that doesn't work, I will honestly keep going because I've seen some wild, you know, situations and conditions where sometimes uh, somebody has a problem uh, in their neck from six years ago and it's affecting their ankle. Or their ankle was fractured six years ago and now they're having a lot of neck problems but their ankle is actually doing okay. But their ankle appears okay and it's really not. Um, and so that's kind of, um, you know, to, to sum it up, it's all connected for a reason, right? It's because if I have a performance, if I'm going to a class that I'm really excited about, if I'm going to just, you know, social dance after several years, your body says, I really want to do that. I don't have good hip muscle strength. I have a hundred other muscles I can pull from. Let me do it this time. It's a survival mechanism and then you'll be fine. When that happens over six months, a year, that now that becomes painful. Now your body starts screaming out saying, hey, listen, you pay attention to me because you know this isn't this isn't working out. And I always recommend, and I even kind of did my own testing. Uh, I used myself as a guinea pig at times where, you know, when I started doing arrows, I was doing so much strength training, a ton of strength training. And I did pretty well. I had no no real injuries. I backed off of the strength training for the past two months. And for the first time, I was doing an over um, around the back or a Lindy flip, and my elbow got caught in my partner, and I got a little scared for the first time in a long time. But I had other occurrences happen where things fell on me, and I I was totally fine. Like I was like, oh, okay, wow, all right, I'm good. And this was the first time I got a little bit scared, and I was like, okay, good. This is this is why we do this. It's not always to build the muscle, although it is. It's also to get your brain to know how to respond to accidents and things that happen to overuse, to a partner who's a beginner, to a partner who's exhausted, to if you yourself are exhausted. It's exercise as a way to train yourself before the dance floor so that the dance floor becomes just automatic and it's enjoyable and you do it for the reason that you want to do it. Now, um, same thing, I, I, I reduced my stamina um, for the past uh, month. And so even going through routines, I feel like, oh, I'm a little bit winded. I got to get back on it. Um, and so, so that being said, there's also things that you can do you know, to, you, you don't always want to dance more to, to, to become more fit to dance. You want to become more fit to be able to dance. 
However, there are the occasional people that I talk to that, that dance helps the fitness. So it's always this kind of game of, you know, balance, a balancing act and, you know, you know, seeing where things overcompensate and undercompensate. And not, no two people are the same. Some people are alike, but there are no two people are the same. And what works for me doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. Um, but what I always say to, to sum up this part of the, of the talk is really listen to your body. Really listen to um, what your body's asking for. There's other things that are not all physical, you know, that you know we can kind of discuss in another call that, that I've definitely had my experiences and doing really well and not doing so well at times. Uh, it's stress levels, it's drinking enough water, it's eating the right foods, it's making sure that you're fueled before you go dancing, it's making sure that you rest and you recover and do something different uh, to give your body a chance to just do its thing. Your body is meant to, to, to recover and, and heal. We just have to give it the right environment and, and give it the enough correct prompts and the correct inputs to allow itself to do that. Okay. So, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Um, but so now I want to transition into what I, I said. I, I'm not sure if um, the people are here who um, I had for asking questions. I just, for the sake of time, I wanted to see if uh, there's Anna. I have Anna Maria. Anna Maria Ariane Mako and Evelyn and I think I see Ariane on here. So I'm going to give Ariane the floor to ask a question, if you like. So we're going to, right now it's just a Q&A. And obviously I think we have plenty of time. And so I want to get any specific questions that you might have uh, to be able to answer. So feel free to unmute yourself. And uh, let's have just a conversation. Okay. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> sure. All right. So, if there are no questions, I'm, I mean, I'm just curious. I'll ask again. I'm not sure if people were were not um, on board, but I just want to know what people's. You know, where are you uh, from? What kind of dance uh, and swing dance you are participating in mostly? And if you're a follow or a lead or a switch. Yeah, hi Samantha. Yeah, same. Yeah, <laughs> shag foot, I like that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, good question. And so there, there's a couple things. The one is like the mental part, right? So if you feel like you're becoming less flexible and it's impeding on your dancing, then that's that's a that's not a problem, but I am more I'll listen to you more. But if you're like, you know, my dancing is good, it's actually maybe a little bit better, and I feel tighter though. I don't like that feeling, just I don't like being tight, but your dancing is okay then that's a different conversation. So if you had to pick one, or you could be in the middle, on a spectrum, where would you say you are? Like, it's impeding my performance, I don't, or it's, it's just, I don't like the feeling, or both. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so, it hurt, so is it tight enough where it bothers you, like throughout the day you're thinking about it? Mm 
Okay, gotcha. So, um, usually with someone like yourself who's hypermobile in general, and then you're sitting a lot, it's 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 like a double-edged sword. But with someone like you, usually the unsexy muscles are the ones that are going to be very weak, and if you wake those up, you're going to feel that tension start to calm down. And by the unsexy muscles, I mean like on your ankle, you have so this is your ankle, right? This is the top of your ankle, your foot. You have muscles here that move your ankle out, and you have muscles on the inside that move your ankle in. Those muscles are often overlooked. Like there's no gym exercise equipment that, that does that. So what I usually do is I will put an ankle weight or a strap something, and you lay on your side and you lift the ankle up, and you control it. And you don't even need a weight. I would even say right now, I think you're on your couch or a chair or something like that. If you put your ankle out with your heel hanging off like the edge of your couch or something, and all you do is this, just do a slow roll one direction, you might feel this kind of jittery. Your toes might try to clench and do this. And so that's me addressing these two unsexy muscles, the ones that are overlooked, and then your calf is doing all the work or your toe muscles are doing all the work. But that's why I call it like a cube because you have the front and you have the back, you have the two sides, and there's other, other sides obviously, but these two sides and someone like you are usually overlooked. So yeah, I would, you come into a clinic and then make you do calf raises, and you get tighter, you don't like it, and you stop, because it's uncomfortable. When in fact, your calf muscles are pretty solid, and probably one out of four muscles are doing all the work. So that calf muscle is the one that's overworked. If you work on the one that's on top, like even just the right now, you just try it, let me know what you think. Lift up your ankle and lower it down and see if you have a tremble like this without your toes locking out. Give it a try. Yeah, you're trying to make it smooth. You're trying to do what my hand is doing right now with your foot. And it, is that possible? Yeah. Then you do a circle. Yeah. And is it, is it smooth or is it kind of jitter a bit? A little more kind of trembly, right? Yeah, and so even just without any resistance, the fact that you have a little bit of tremble there with no resistance, just gravity, imagine when your whole body weight gets on top and you have to do these little isolated movements. That's why when there's athletes like yourself, we put a, a resistance on, even if it's like five pounds, three pounds, put a weight or some type of resistance um, on your foot, then you're gonna see that tremble happen. That's just an example. It could be your hips, the outsides of your hips, like laying on your side and doing leg raises. You might find that your calf muscle calms down. Doing glute bridges, like on your back, lifting your butt up. Making sure that you squeeze your butt muscle and you feel the, 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 the tension there and the fatigue there. And then in a normal person who doesn't exercise, it's like 30 to 50, that's normal. For an athlete, if you dance, it's gonna be a little bit more than that, or just all on one leg. So there's a kind of like metrics, like you're a PhD, so data, right? Maybe you're, you're not, maybe qualitative or quantitative, but like there's metrics and data that you want to collect on your body the same way. So if you're jumping, but on the couch with air, you're trembling even a little bit, you don't have the strength, but it's not the cap. So I'm, I'm thinking that the cap for you is normal. So you pass with flying clothes. It's probably doing too much. You want to work on the inside and the outside ankle exercise, uh, muscles in the top one as well. Then I would go check your hip to see if your hip on the outside is strong, your groin is, is strong, your butt muscle in the back is strong. And after that, your body might say, all right, the calf is doing 200% of the work. Let me drop it down to 120 because I'm getting help from the top and the bottom, right? And so if you do overall strength training, your calf muscle is 200% will go up to 220%, 230%. That's why when you think about strengthening, you're going to get a little bit timid because you're like, I feel like I'm going to be sore everywhere. But it's really a matter of like, out of these three muscles, and you're doing an exercise that uses all three, number one is doing 200%, it's gonna go up to 225, and the, the other two are just gonna drop down. And so that's why the timidity of, you know, when you, when you say the word strength, it bothers me. When you say the word flexibility, it bothers me. It's because your brain already knows, and I can already tell, hey, these are the smaller muscles that you won't find in the gym, <laughs> or at home, or on YouTube, clearly that that's what you're missing. So I wouldn't even stretch you. I would actually massage, like do foam roll. Like you, your body knows it, right? That's kind of the mind-body connection. Like, you know you want a foam roll to loosen it up. It's to, it's to reduce the tension. You don't want to stretch it. You just want to reduce the tension that's in there. But the tension that's there is because something around it is not helping out. So I would say work on the outside and the inside ankle muscles, like way on your side, go out, way on the other side, go in, and be smooth and intentional. As you start to smooth out everything, 
or not even flexing up and down. You could be at your chair with your foot hanging off and just lift up your ankle and just be very controlled. As you get a little bit better, you put a weight on it, like an ankle weight from Amazon, like I don't know, 10 bucks or something, or get a bag of rice and just tape it. Um, just find some resistance to, to put on top of it. Um, but try that. But those are little clues where you're like, oh, strength bothers me. That's a clue that out of four muscles, this one's the one that's bothering you and your mind's on it. It's because these three muscles are overlooked. Okay? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. Because I know usually what happens. It's, 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 I always, even when I see a patient and I'm like, I give them an exercise. And I could see it in their eyes, they're like, I've done that before. Then I'm like, oh, don't do that, stop it. And then I test three other things, and usually when I test on number two and three in a particular manner, then it becomes weak. And I'm like, and they're like, oh, oh my gosh. And they go home, they do it, and it's like two weeks later, their body changes, and they're like, oh, I don't have to stress. And they usually forget, they don't tell me. Like, I have to be like, hey, how's your ankle doing? And they're like, oh, it's good. And they go back to dance, and I'm like, Thanks for letting me know six months ago, you know, but it's finding out those two or three muscles that are overlooked that are not the common ones that you see on the internet, at the gym, or anywhere else in, in the clinics, to be frank with you. Okay? All right, cool. So, Adam, you want to uh, ask me the question out loud, or do you want to just go from the comments? Thanks a lot, Samantha. All right, so, Adam, uh, Okay, sure. So I'll read it out loud. So Adam, uh, you're, he's, Adam says, Hi, we're a couple from Prague, Czech Republic. Adam and Anna. Oh, thanks for being here. Both of us like to switch, mainly dancing Lindy. Awesome. Okay, the question is, I have a question. Do you have any suggestions for how to stretch the outer side of the thighs? So, uh, outer th side of the thighs. Um, so is this, is this your hip or the thigh? Like there's your hip where like your pocket is in your pants. Um, or is it uh, down below that between that part of your hip and, and your knee? Thigh and around the knee, okay. So, all right. So typically, there, as I mentioned earlier, there's the IT band, right? Um, So there's the IT band that's not really quite a muscle, right? So if you're talking about the thigh and around the knee, you have, okay, so if this is the knee, okay, pretend this is your knee, you have the quad muscle on the top, okay, so the top of your thigh muscle. You have the IT band, so here, this is my bone, so think of that as the IT band. Now, right below that is your hamstring, okay, it's your hamstring muscle that bends your knee down, and then you have, like, the lateral part of the quad muscle, which is, a muscle and they all go right into this is your knee joint they all go into your knee joint so typically it's not this it's literally the hamstring and the quad and so what you can usually do is stretch out the hamstring in a particular way where you turn the leg in and so I'm gonna actually try to stand up and show you in one second So let me see if I can move the camera. And I'm gonna get off my uh, headphones for just one second to show you, to show you um, what you can do for that part of the hamstring. So I think, I think I can get it, get you to be able to see it. Okay. So if you do a hamstring stretch, and I think you can, I'm gonna yell to make sure you can hear me, and I'll, I'll say it again once I get to the computer, but with a typical hamstring stretch, you're going to do something like this. And it's going to get the back of it. Remember, we are three-dimensional. We're in a dance style that, well, a lot of dances, like our dance that we're always rotating and changing positions. So this kind of linear things or exercises or stretches will get you somewhere. But if I'm doing a hamstring stretch here, that's great for the back and the actual true hamstring, what it does. If you're trying to get the back of the knee around here, what I would do is I would just tweak it and just put a little bit of a twist to it. And I would grab my knee and pull, and I could play around with this in certain areas. Like I feel it a lot there for myself. 
You might feel it somewhere here. You might twist, you might bend, you might even arch up and get a little bit more of a uh, stretch. So you can try that. Sometimes even with a little bit of a bend, okay? If I bend my knee a little bit, I can get a different spot. And obviously I'm not, uh, I don't have that discomfort, so I might not feel it. But this is where I take the standard stretch that you see on the internet or in fitness places, and you give it a little bit of a, no pun intended, a twist. I can turn my foot in a bit, okay? I can turn my body a bit. I can bend my knee a little bit. I can do this typical stretch and do something like that. Um, so that's for the, if it's the hamstring. So the hamstring, think of it, it's on the back corner of this block. If it's the quad, what I would typically do, sometimes, sometimes you can get this pain over here um, because it's the quad. And so just doing a typical quad stretch can actually do the trick. So if I do this, that can do it. I can actually pull my foot out a little bit as long as I don't have too, many, this, too much discomfort. I can bring it across my body. I can also put it on top of something and lean back and twist a little bit. I can even bring my foot across and see if I can find a particular spot. And then just linger, I just linger in that spot. So it's really, um, to do, to answer your question, to answer your particular question, that's how I would find that spot to stretch out. Um, it's, it's either the, it's usually on the, like I said, this is, this is, this is where it hurts. It's usually this quad muscle on the outside or it's the hamstring muscle on the outside that's giving you this pain over here. It's usually not the IT band, but if it is the IT band, um, sometimes you need to massage it. And there is tissue and fascia that runs along that area that there have been studies that, you know, um, one of my old mentors and professors, they did research that for some reason when you foam roll the IT band, the fascia underneath the IT band, it's like this and it gets loosened up. And that's what gives you the relief. The IT band doesn't really stretch. It's like a leather belt. You can't really stretch it too much. And so, <clears throat> so that's, that would be my suggestion. If it's just to answer your question, uh, how to stretch the out, outer side of the thighs, that's what I would do. Um, if, you know, I'm looking at why is the, it needs stretching, that's a different question because I'm actually looking at exactly what I talked about earlier is that the knee is doing too much of this and your hamstring and the outer uh, thigh is trying to hold you together and protect you. Okay. So Adam, let me know that kind of got even a little bit to answer your question. Yeah, good. So it's really kind of tweaking. If you have a partner, you know, hold on to the wall, have your partner lift up your leg gently, and then just have them kind of move in and out. Instead of using this high chair that I use, if you have a partner, you know, if you have a couple and a partner, they can actually help you with it, be gentle. Because with stretches, I try to tell people, or even with myself, I want to be as relaxed as possible. Because if I'm holding something up and I'm like tensing, guess what? You're stretching the muscle and just tensing it up right, 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 right away. So any help that you can get with something else, someone else is, is beneficial as long as you trust the other person. If you don't, uh, that's, that's gonna be a problem and, and cause more stress. Okay. All right. Cool, so I'm just looking at some notes, but um, are there any more questions? Otherwise, um, for the sake of time, I'm going to start to wrap it up and um, I thank you all for, you know, uh, even being a little bit engaged. It tells me that there is a need for this. And, you know, I actually also selfishly when I go to the dance floor and someone has a, has a wrist uh, guard on or, you know, they tell me that something's bothering me, I feel, I feel terrible. I'm like, all right, I want to get you better so I can dance with you. But I know that it can be mentally, you know, frustrating when you can't dance. And um, for me, it's been, you know, something that's been a very, very important part of my life. So to take that away from anybody uh, just makes me, you know, feel terrible. And I'm a, I'm a healthcare provider, so I think that's a, just a natural thing that, that I that I want to help. But I'm passionate about swing dance. I'm passionate about helping people with their injuries and making sure that they say dancing as much as they want. Okay. So, with that being said, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And um, I will probably host another one of these very soon because I realized that there's people from all over the world. And someone, uh, two people from Australia uh, wanted to be here, but they, they couldn't because I think it's like, extremely late in, uh, in Australia. So just be on the lookout for that. If you have friends in other parts of the country, uh, let me know. And um, I will be at ILHC if anybody's going to be there in May. 
And feel free to message me um, on Facebook and uh, I'll, I'll try to, you know, be as helpful as possible. Any questions are helpful for me. The more specific, the more detailed, the more questions I get, the better content I can create. Okay? All right, everybody. Have a great one and I'll talk soon. See you soon and swim strong.